We are available on Spotify and YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe for our latest episode. This podcast is lit. If you have low test scores, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but my class ain't one. Hit me! 99 problems, but my class ain't one. If your test scores are low, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but my class ain't one. Welcome to the This Podcast is Lit podcast with me, Mr. Perkins, Mr. Ackroyd. Hello, sir. Hi, yeah. You all right? Miss Ray. Hello, Hello. Hey. And DJ Zoom. <laughs> How are you doing, Hello. DJ? Not bad, thank you. Yeah, still loving lockdown? Obviously. <laughs> okay, well, to be honest with you, there's only really one place where we can start this week's podcast. And that is in relation to a phenomenally, ridiculously, stupidly brilliant album cover <laughs> which has been produced by some of our Year 10 students. And uh, it's got Aki Boy on the front looking rather cool. <laughs> so did you like the way you were presented on the album cover? Oh, fantastic. I loved it. I've got to say, I, I've not laughed that much for a long time. I just thought it was really good. <laughs> but I like the way, I like what I really like is the way that obviously I am cool and they've made me look <laughs> even cooler. Um, and you're, Mr. Perkins, you're not cool, and they've managed to make you look less cool. Great job, yeah. kids. Great job. <laughs> While we're discussing what they've made us look like, of all the pictures that could have been chosen, they've chosen the one where I dressed up as a dead woman. Um, I'm not entirely sure I, I'm yeah, ex- excited about this cover. <laughs> it was for World Book Day. I'm not uh, entirely right. sure that I'm loving this as much as you two are. I you you look a bit angry in that uh, picture as well. That's, like that's you just mean my business. Case. That's just my face, Mr. Atacoid. Have you heard of resting, you know, what face? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they weren't able to find a, a starter picture of Mr. G, were they? I think they got one from the... Which is from, strange, because if they'd asked me, I've got hundreds of silly pictures of Mr. G. I would have happily shared them. <laughs> there we go, Year 10 students. If you want to <laughs> make some silly album pictures of Mr. G, you know where to go. You know but they don't necessarily there. have to be for the album. They can be for whatever you want to do with them. Your wallpaper at home, your book covers, whatever you want. I'll send them to you, it's fine. Absolutely. It was interesting that they chose Madcon out of all the artists out there, a band famous for the song Begging. I was wondering whether that was in reference <laughs> to Mr. Atcoid who begs for marks every week. <laughs> I, I don't think it's to do with marks, Mr. Atcoid loving that band. <laughs> I've never heard of the band, to be honest, but I, I, certainly, uh, I certainly appreciated the sentiment. I, I thought it was great, great work. It was brilliant. There you go. Well, we know what song to play every time uh, Mr. Ackroyd begs DJ Zooms for marks in the future anyway. Uh, DJ Zoom, you'll have to get that lined up ready. <laughs> Is there a song okay. called Emotional Blackmail? Because I might start using that. <laughs> um, brilliant. Okay then, guys. Well, let's get cracking with this week's podcast. And we are looking at the poem Remains by Simon Armitage, the poet laureate. And this week, go first with her poem in a headline is Miss Ray. I've gone very short and very sweet this week. I've gone for Haunted. One word? Yep. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, Mr. Ackroyd has been marked down in the past for having a headline that's too long. What's made you go for one that's so short? Don't Um, try and leave the witness, Mr. Firkins. (laughs) Leave me out of it. Um, I just think it's in one word completely summarises the poem. The poem is about the power of memories, the power of memories that have to haunt you. And then it has that, um, those connotations of death and destruction. I think it just sums it up really nicely. Brilliant. Mr. Ackroyd, your poem in a headline. I've gone for the shattered shell of a broken soldier. Oh. Nice. Play, nice use of the word shell there as well. Yeah, I tried to go shattered, shell, broken, obviously remains. Uh, and that idea that what's left is, you know, is broken. Gosh, he's getting shorter, shorter and shorter and <laughs> every single week. Um, OK, wow. Um, I, I wasn't ready. And he said that I, well, I'm not moment. ready. I was, I was waiting for at least a minute for what it was my turn. The poem in a headline should be fairly short, shouldn't it? <laughs> past you would disagree, Mr. Ackroyd. <laughs> I, say, to listen to I think, a few of the past I, to, to be honest, I think sometimes you do need to analyse it. I think that speaks for itself. It's so good, it speaks for itself. There we That's go. That's the one. There we go. You, wow. you said that, not me. 
Okay, so my poem in a headline is Victorious Soldiers Lose Personal Fight with Own Conscience. And that's because, really, I think this poem probably explores the idea that whilst you can literally win a battle on a battlefield as a soldier, um, it looks like you're doomed to lose uh, the long-term game anyway. It appears from reading a poem like this and from other sort of bits that you can read about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that really it's only the politicians and the strategists, the military strategists that actually ever win these battles and that the, the sort of like the political pawns, the soldiers themselves, always come out on the losing end with very little support. Uh, when it comes to their time um, back at home once the battles are finished. DJ Zoom with the scores. Okay, so uh, some nice headlines then. Thank you for keeping it short this week. Makes it a lot easier for me to remember stuff. Uh, <laughs> for four points, Mr. Firkins, the victorious soldier. I kind of uh, forgot the last bit of it. Unfortunately. Something about a conscience, something about political pawns. Uh, I did you, like you it. Said, you said something about something. I can't quite remember what it was. <laughs> but he's my boss. I'm going to give him four points anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, next of also four points, uh, Mr. Ackroyd, Saturn shell of a broken soldier. Uh, well explained. Very nice. Again, a little bit long for me. Definitely the shortest one, Haunted, uh, very captures the whole poem and the importance of what it actually does. And you can do a lot with such a short word. And I think it's uh, a nice, quick one to remember the poem by. So five points to Miss Ray. Looking very handsome today, Mr. Mr. J. <laughs> I like your hair. Blackmail works. Blackmail? <laughs> and wait. <laughs> Flattery, I think, is the word. Flattery is the word. What is the most important quote and why? Okay, so what is the most important quote and why? This is a segment where we try to help students with their revision. If you only go into an exam remembering one quotation, this is the one that we're suggesting that you remember because it's important. It sums up the poem and allows you to access the upper echelons of the mark schemes and helps you to get high marks. Going first this week with uh, most important quote and why is Mr. Ackroyd. What is your most important quote and why? Yeah, I've gone for one that most people would maybe even miss. And I just wanted to show, this isn't the explanation of it, by the way, but I just wanted to show <laughs> to students how nothing, um, everything is up for grabs in poetry. There's no wasted line. I've gone for, I blink and he bursts through the door. Um, I think I'll start with the burst bit, the verb, the gunfire, mm. that reminds him of the, uh, the sound imagery of when he was in Iraq that sets him off on his sensory element of, of the PTSD. But it's that word blink that could be just a thrown away line, but actually you zoom into that a little bit more, it's got connotations of life flashing before your eyes, the flashing element, the danger of the flashing element. It's got the blink is another word for, for broken, is something is on the blink, you're broken. And just a little bit of research so that a human blinks 28,000 times a day which most of us, it's just throw away habitual. Actually, what this is showing is that every time he blinks, all 28,000 times during the day, he sees this image. That's 28,000 times a day. And how horrific this PTSD is. It's an actual waking nightmare. Okay, well. Wow. I've just done a, a little fact check on that. And Google says it's actually 12,000 times a day, Mr. Ackroyd. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but I think I, I, I did Google it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not something you know. <laughs> okay, um, moving on to my most important quote and why. Well, my most important quote and why is um, one that I think Simon Armitage himself probably considers to be the most important quote and why, because he repeats it uh, <clears throat> throughout the poem, and it's probably armed, possibly not. Now, the reason why I believe this is the most important is the lack of certainty in the uh, in the words that are being used by him here. So this idea of it being probably armed, we get this sense that everything's happening so quickly, so the, the speed of the situation, the blur, the blink of an eye, uh, as Mr. Atkins was just talking about, and we get this sense that he doesn't know for certain whether this looter was armed. 
And that makes a massive difference as to how he now retrospectively sees this problem in his own mind. Because is he actually a murderer? Well, probably as a pre-modifier here, in all likelihood, he probably isn't a murderer, this soldier. He's probably done the right professional thing. He's seen somebody who is, you know, potentially equipped to use lethal force, and he's taken him down as he should do. But there's that tiny bit of doubt in his mind where he says possibly not. That post-modifier possibly has that doubt creeping in, that lack of certainty, that lack of clarity, this idea that he'll be spending the rest of his life playing over this uncertainty. The fact it's repeated throughout the poem and the fact that it appears when he's back at home on his own sofa shows that. Has he committed a murder? Ha is he a murderer? Is he a killer? All these questions which will never leave him. Miss Ray, most important quote and why? <clears throat> I've gone for his blood shadow stays on the street and I've gone for that because actually I think it's a really really interesting one to be able to zoom in on those individual words and I talk to the kids that I teach an awful awful lot about the power of zooming into individual words so it begins with the word his it's about that belonging it's about that ownership but we still don't know that man's name we know nothing about the man that died then we get onto the blood, the life force. As soon as you mention blood, you start thinking about life, you start thinking about heart, you start thinking about somebody that's alive. But it's not real. That blood is a shadow. It's not real blood anymore because that person isn't a real person anymore. That person is dead. Then the word shadow, it's the lack of light, it's the lack of hope. And now my classes know that I talk to them so much about light and dark imagery because it is so, so powerful. As soon as you start thinking about light representing hope and happiness, you can then start thinking about, okay, what does Armitage mean when he takes that light and happiness away? There is no hope. But for who? Is it the man who's died? Is it the soldier? Is it armies in general is it humanity in general what the, what point is armitage trying to make in terms of the lack of hope and then it ends with the alliteration we get the shadow stays on the street now it's something that was alluded to in the lesson that mr ackway did earlier actually that alliteration that sibilance starts to make you think about speed is it the speed of the bullets is it the speed of the decisions is it the speed of the thought or is it at the moment the speed of the memories about how quickly they invade his mind tj zoom with the scores Okay, okay, okay. Some very nice quotes there. Uh, so, with four points, uh, Mr. Ackroyd, a very nice explanation. Uh, thank you for Googling the, the facts for me. <laughs> no, uh, I I've actually, it. I went on just, just, just to, I'm not bothered about the points, but just the idea that you do, you do, you do blink between 12 and 14,000 times a day. But the reason I said 28,000 times is because he doesn't sleep. Oh, I see. So it becomes 24 hours. Uh, so which makes it even more horrific. So he's not only used Google, he's used maths as well. Yeah. Classic yeah. maverick, classic yeah, maverick. I'm nice. across the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, idea behind it being a waking nightmare. <laughs> um, was it not, is it not the brink, not blink of something? Yeah, when you go to the brink of something. But, but I never mentioned blink. that. Yes, yeah. something's, on, something's <laughs> on the blink means it's broken. Are you not meant to be listening, Mr. DJ? Is that, is <laughs> that, not, is that, <laughs> that not your one job? You get the sense he's only just woken up, don't you? He's like, oh, whatever I said in my one, now it's whatever you said in your one. <laughs> I'll keep it at four points. <laughs> <laughs> You're not marking him down. You're not marking him down from that room, too. No, no, I'll allow him this time. This time. <laughs> Uh, next, Mr. Perkins with five points, possibly and probably. I like the idea that the modifiers and it kind of uh, goes through the poem, and it possibly is Armitage's uh, his favorite part of the poem. So, for you, five points. And for Miss Ray's, the idea of the sibilance, lots of layers of meaning, and it definitely links to everything else as well. Uh, so, for you, five points as well. Fantastic. Structure. This is a segment of the show where we talk about structure. We talk about it because we believe that if you're looking for the very highest grades, you will look at the structures used by poets and you will have a think about why they've adopted certain structures and how it makes an effect on the final product and, and how we end up reading and engaging with the poem. Um, so guys, is there anything about this poem which we've noticed structurally? Go on, miss. I'm, I'm 
Oh, I, to apologize. I, was, like, first. I, was, I was trying to I was be polite. Asia, yeah. I was going Asia for beauty. Um, <laughs> I think for me, <laughs> I think for me, the biggest thing is the enjoyment. And actually, it just reflects how, and it's something you touched on in the um, at the beginning of the lesson, Mr. Atwood, where she said he uses quite a lot of colloquial language. He uses a lot of slang. And it does reinforce that. The enjoyment reinforces that this is almost like a conversation. This is one man sitting in front of you retelling his story. But it does also then reflect at how how quickly this story moves and how quickly those emotions and those thoughts and those memories are going through him. Yeah, um, I, I like the, the idea behind the, the last stanza. It's, it's two lines. Every other stanza is four lines and that last stanza obviously on purpose is shorter. It's half of four, two is half of four. Therefore, oh, it, it, it emphasises um, that he's, he's not fully whole, he's half a yeah. person come back half a person and what just precedes that as well is the land and the sand the only rhyming couplet in the whole poem so that link between this soldier at home and what happened in a foreign land is um, linked by rhyme and the effect is that the consequences are that he becomes half a person it's it very clever I think the, the rhyme, the end, the end rhyme, and the fact it's a masculine rhyme, makes it very inward looking, it makes it very tight. You almost get yeah. the impression that the Armitage is just, or the, the narrator of the poem, is just looking in on himself. He's almost like collapsing in on himself. Yeah, and do you know what? what the, 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 my favourite bit of the whole lesson, and, and the students were brilliant in terms of their engagement, mm, but absolutely. I just love it when a student comes up with an idea that I've not even, that's not even occurred to me. And I think I might have mentioned, I don't know whether you were in on it, Mr. Perkins, when I said this, I don't know whether it occurred to either of you two, what I think it was Isabel said, that she thought it was two lines at the end, because basically it comes down to him and the person he killed in the end, those two people. And I just thought it was brilliant, because it's not even occurred to me. All my analysis, trying to look at things yeah. really deeply. Students just look back at it, seen this, and come at it from their own angle. Oh, great. That's the great thing about being an English teacher, to be yeah. fair, isn't it? The fact that every yeah. single year we might well be teaching the same poems, but every time we teach a poem, a different class will do things slightly differently. And there might only be little differences here and there, slight nuances, but they, they, they make it so worthwhile. And I think that's why we're so happy in our jobs as English teachers, for sure. <laughs> Let's move I think on five to points our... for Isabel before we move on. I think five points for Isabel. DJ Zoom, what do you reckon? Definitely. <laughs> Ten points. Absolutely. <laughs> Ten points. Whoa. <laughs> Ten points for Isabel. That's if this, that's if DJ Zoom is listening to that bit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what you fools don't know. Okay, so let's move on to the last segment. You nearly there, DJ Zoom. Nearly, nearly can uh, curl back up again. Um, <laughs> this bit is what you two fools don't know. And uh, I'll start with this one and I'm going to start by just comparing it really to the other war poems. Uh, a lot of the war poems in this particular cluster, uh, Power and Conflict, are set you know, in the past. Uh, this, this poem is set in the past but are more of a uh, not quite so far in the distance. So we're not running over trenches like we are in bayonet charge or an exposure. We're not running into machine gun fire but I don't think war has moved on when you read this poem. It might not be the same scale. We no longer have 20 million people dying in a single war, but we still have a same lack of dignity and honor in the actual soldiers themselves. It feels like that way anyway. This is the only poem in this cluster where the soldiers don't really, sorry, there is only one poem in this cluster where we do have any of that, and that's in charge of the light brigade, but all the others, it just feels like the soldiers have no honour and dignity. And it's a shame because soldiers give up so much to fight for their country. They give up everything. They give up their own lives. But nobody seems to win. Everybody, the looters, the British soldiers, everybody's losing. And I feel like um, this poem is in this conflict cluster for so many reasons. It's every type of conflict you can imagine. There's a, there's a loss of personal identity, there's guilt, there's him beating himself up, there's not being able to live with yourself, there's psychological torture, there's post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a moment, a fleeting moment, a flashing moment that haunts him and his whole life forever. And he turns back to Britain with no help, no support, no counselling, no effective counselling anyway. He's left to his own devices, not being able to differentiate himself between a criminal, a looter, 
and, and he looks at himself and, and he almost can't see the difference. Where is this man's support? Where is his therapy? Where is his counselling? Mental health is something which needs to be spoken about in this country. We need to raise awareness for mental health issues and concerns. And Simon Armitage, the poet, has done a wonderful job in not only raising awareness of mental health in general, but specifically for these soldiers who give up so much and seemingly return back to this country with no help or support whatsoever. Mr. Ackroyd, what you two fools don't know. Yeah, mine has a similar thread in many ways, but I just wanted to say how clever and multi-layered this poem is uh, and how Armitage controls it like a puppet master. We all know about the allusions to Macbeth, they're, they're pretty obvious, but the biggest allusion in the poem to me is to Wilfred Owen, who is, we sp we've spoken about in terms of exposure. He, um, and the way that Wilfred Owen criticised the powers that be whilst raising awareness for the conditions of the soldiers. Very skillful to do that. So when I'm reading it, I empathise with the man. I think he's a decent man in there. You know, I feel for him. Yet there are subtle um, underlays in this poem where Marmitage is calling out the bigger powers that be. Woo! But specifically, the allusion to Wilfred Owen's poem, Dulce Decorum Est, um, translated, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. I can't get away from them. I'm going to give you a few quotes from Dulce Decorum Est in here and we'll compare them to remains. There's a sleep, which is obvious. Bloodshod in Dulce Decorum Est, blood shadow. Um, quick boys in the colloquial lang language of one of my mates. Jolt in Dulce Decorum Est, stunned in remains. Smothering in Dulce Decorum Est, smothered in remains. Wagon in Dulce Decorum Est, lorry in remains. And the obvious ones of blood. And this quote, in my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering and choking from Dulce Decorum Est. Even in that poem, he's replaying the dreams. And what makes this even more impressive is we know Wilfred Owen had shell shock. And what he's saying is, like what Mr. Firkin said a hundred years later, soldiers are being plunged into this nightmare, still suffering from PTSD. But what Armitage does here really is makes a wider point that a hundred years later, these wars are ultimately self-defeating because you're sending, the powers that be are sending men over to other countries and they're coming back broken. That is self-defeating because they are damaging the country they are coming back to and the sickness comes back to the countries. So with all what we're left with is the guilt and the shame of uh, an invader. Nice work. Miss Ray, what you two fools don't know. Well, I've taken a slightly different route and I've gone for a little bit um, of a slightly deeper language analytical um, route. And I want to talk about um, Armitage's use of polysyndetism. Um, and I'm not particularly good at saying that, so I'm never going to say that again. Um, but the, it's the idea that actually you use coordinating conjunctions in a sentence. You might use and or but or or um, to suggest that the, the clauses in the sentence are of equal importance. And I'll zoom in on, on two instances when he does that and talk about why in a moment. But for me, that is the whole crux of the poem. He spends the entire poem with a dilemma. It's him, and he's worth trying to work out whether what he did was right. He is trying to work out whether his conscience or what he was being told to do is right. And I think that's quite interesting in terms of the, the idea about how it links to a power and conflict cluster, because the power has been taken away from him. By following orders, he has had his pow the power taken away from him. And the conflict between what he believes in and the orders that he was given and his own conscience are really, really prevalent. So we get the quotes, myself and somebody else and somebody else. So it's done to suggest that he didn't act alone. It's definitely something that Mr. Ackroyd was uh, mentioning in his lesson. It also starts to think about actually, are all of those soldiers equally guilty? So that's the first um, time we see that. But then when we move slightly on, and it was Mr. Firkins, it was, the, it was the slightly alternative version of Mr. Firkins' quote from earlier. He says, and he's probably armed and possibly not. It's that additional and in the second time we hear that quote. That means that it takes longer to say. It's, it's not quite as short as it was before. It adds more weight to the possibly not. It's almost like by being at home, he's had time to think about it. He's had time to reminisce and reflect on what it was. And actually, has he come to the decision that maybe he wasn't armed? Is he now thinking, actually, I don't think he was armed? But what has changed? 
is it the guilt is he is he sitting at home safely and that's given him guilt the fact that he's got home safely and this man obviously doesn't get home safely or is his memory kind of adjusting and not being particularly reliable now obviously we don't know that but i it comes back to that idea that armitage sets up a dilemma and he sets up the idea that there are two things in conflict here your human instinct to survive and then the orders that are that the poem um the narrator of the poem is being given those are the two main conflicts fantastic thank you very much guys good analysis this week thank you um dj zoom with the scores very nice uh, very impressive uh, analysis there miss ray uh, so he was listening. First, he was listening. <laughs> I was definitely listening there. Uh, with eight points, Mr. Perkins. Uh, very nice idea. The idea there's a lack of dignity. I like how it links back to the other poems as well. Very nicely explained. Uh, for Mr. Ackroyd, nine points. The allusions to Macbeth. I don't really know that one. Didn't really make that connection. Uh, yeah, but very nice one. idea. Yeah, you said uh, there was allusions to oh. Macbeth. Yeah, symbolism my, my of the life, blood and yeah. bloody life in my bloody hands. Yeah, I didn't really ever pick up on that one, so I've got right, to use okay. that my lessons. Uh, mm -hmm. So for you, almost 10 points, but nine points for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but very nice linking to Wilfred Owen. Nine, nine and a half, then. <laughs> <laughs> nine. There you go. And, and that, Mr. Ackroyd, is why the kids pick Mad Con. I've explained this already. <laughs> He's begging for points. Yes. And then finally, Miss Ray, uh, that was a great idea. I didn't never ever thought of this, the idea that Elon Gates, the idea that it's um, that there's a conflict as well, even when what he's saying, it links massively to everything else. And I'll definitely be stealing that one and for you mm -hmm. 10 points. Fantastic. Very so good how... today, Mr. Drew. I think as well, I think that just going on from that, I think that, that is a good one, that the, the, the extra and, and the way that you analyse that. Uh, I, want, to I, me want to well, Ray, it, I want to hear Miss Ray explain what that's called again. Um, it redeems, I, it redeems him. <laughs> it redeems him almost as a good man in my eyes. I'm not yeah. saying he is a good man because he's killed someone, but that and is, he, he's mm. thinking back on it, and that's what makes yeah. him a good man in a way. He's admitted his guilt. He's admitted that he is guilty for doing something wrong. That uh, reflection. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay then, so DJ Zoom with the final leaderboard. The final leaderboard is thus. Uh, joint second place this week is Mr. Firkins and Mr. Ackroyd with 17 points. I and thought I had 17 and a half. Nope. <laughs> Bergen, Bergen. <laughs> Nine, almost ten. Mm, nine and a half. And our runaway winner, <laughs> a runaway winner with maximum points, Miss Ray, 20 points. 20 points, is that full mark? That full gets you everywhere, guys. You mm -hmm. need to be nice to to do. Well done, Miss Ray. Oh, that, that, that felt painful, Miss Ray. No, I, I think I always give credit where credit's due. You didn't say that after Mr. Firkins got full marks. That's interesting. No, because credit wasn't due there. <laughs> so you think this is a better full mark than my full mark? I would say so, yes. I would like to remove myself from the group chat for the next week because I don't think we have to follow Mr. Ackroyd. <laughs> I think Miss Ray did deserve that. I think she did some good analysis there. Yeah, some, there. some good analysis, yeah. some excellent begging, definitely deserved full marks. <laughs> <laughs> she did call you handsome as well, I noticed at one point. DJ, so she was I, did it three a mark I did it that. three times. I have no work, shame. <laughs> Yeah, he, he certainly was listening to that bit anyway. <laughs> so nice okay, to have a set to him. Okay then, guys. Well, thank you for another good podcast. This has been The Maverick, The DJ, Bye. The Brains, and me, Mr. Perkins. For now, goodbye all. Bye. Bye. Bye.